I am glad you're here. We're going to have a great time in the Word today. Acts chapter 8 is where we're going to be. And uh, I'm looking forward to next Sunday, our open house Sunday. And we're going to have a great time together. You've already heard, but I'm going to reiterate. We're going to have the habit truck. Can I get an amen? amen? We're going to have a lot going on for the kids, a pumpkin patch. And we're going to have bouncy houses. And we're doing all of these things. And I think you're aware that these events are intended for us to have an occasion to fellowship. I want you and your family to enjoy them. But I, I'm giving you bait to put on the hook of an invitation so you can bring your friends, your family, your neighbors, and your co-workers. I remember years ago, we were having a day like this, and I was announcing it like this, and a man came to me, and he goes, you're just doing those things so people will come to church. It was like he caught me doing something bad, and I'm like, that's exactly why we're doing this, all right? So we want to have a great Sunday next Sunday, and I want to help you do what I believe you already want to do if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian today, say Amen. I want to bring a message today that I believe can help you do what you already want to do and sometimes we're not doing or we don't know how to do or we need to do more of and we've got a message before us in this passage that I'm so excited about because as a pastor I get to help you do if you're a believer what you already know God wants you to do and what I believe you want to do yourself. We want next Sunday to be a day where your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers and your loved ones can come to a place where they can be introduced, not just to Coastline, to Jesus. Be introduced to a church family that I happen to think is the greatest church family I've ever been a part of. I'm so thankful for you. We want it to be a wonderful day. And this message will be a bit different, but I believe it can help you if you know Jesus to do what you know he wants you to do and what I believe you want to do. The, the Bible's filled with incredible examples of people who use their lives for God's purpose of sharing His news with others. Maybe you can call it witnessing, or soul winning, or testifying, or evangelizing. The Bible's filled with people who, out of love for God and compassion for those who'd yet to meet God, they decided they were going to use any influence God gave them to invite others to an occasion where they can get to know the Lord themselves. I particularly enjoy the example found in the life of a man by the name of Philip. Now, if you've read the New Testament, you're going to read the name of Philip. There are actually two men in the New Testament by the name of Philip. First of all, we get Philip the Apostle, one of those original followers of Jesus Christ. And then there's another Philip, and to kind of keep them separated, we sometimes call this Philip, Philip the Evangelist. He lived an incredible life for Jesus Christ. We first meet him in Acts chapter 6. At that time, he's at the church in Jerusalem, and they'd been just growing by leaps and bounds. Many people who study what's written in God's Word from Acts 1 to Acts 6 have concluded that by about that point, the church in Jerusalem had grown to 100,000 or more, and structure was needed, and servants were needed. And so God's plan was that the church family would get together and choose out from among them seven who could be a special blessing in serving the church. And Philip was one of those original seven that we call deacons. By Acts chapter 8, he's serving in the capacity of a missionary or of an evangelist. His whole life was given over to sharing Jesus with those that he met. And, and in the verses preceding the text that we're going to study today, Philip was preaching to huge crowds of people. And then God took him to just one person. And I love that because we've got a God that loves everybody. He, he doesn't want anyone to be lost. And so Philip goes to reach out to just one person. Any of you know, we've been in this series called Level Up. We're learning the power of good and godly attitudes. And I have found, I have found that those who allow God to use their lives to bless and help and influence others as it relates to coming to know the good news of Jesus Christ, they share some things in common. They share a similar attitude. Now the word attitude means a settled way of looking at someone or something and those who share Jesus have a way of looking at the world around us. And we truly care for their spiritual needs. Philip will show us what this attitude looks like and what this attitude does. And in so doing, he'll be sharing with us what this attitude can look like in our lives and what it will lead us to do. If you're able, I'd like to invite you to join me in standing out of respect for the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 8, I'm going to begin reading in verse 26. Acts chapter 8, and uh, we'll start reading in verse 26. The Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise. 
And go toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. By the way, if you hear the news, you're going to find cities we study in the Bible are, are mentioned even now. And uh, so we see him here in this place that still needs the Lord today, doing a work back then. Verse 27, And he arose and went, and behold, a man of, of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Esaias the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot, Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Esaias, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. And his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I, I pray thee, of, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. As they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, and I think this is important, in verse 37, we find the only biblical criteria for baptism. The one thing needed before someone is baptized. He said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Of God, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. I want you to go back to verse 27, and we find uh, some great words here. Near the beginning of verse 27, the Bible says of Philip, He arose and went. He arose and went. I don't want anyone to leave this room today wondering what it was I was getting to in this message. I'm praying that from this building you will arise and go. Rise and go. Lord, we need you. We've sung that. We confess it now in prayer. We open your word. Please, God, help us to glean from the example of Philip that has been inspired by your spirit and preserved for us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. The world we live in is just filled with segregation. Segregation. People are divided into groups and into subgroups sometimes over ethnicity or socioeconomic standing, sometimes political affiliation, and, and, and on and on it goes. And we all know what it is to be labeled. We also all know what it is to take labels upon ourselves. So many in America today want to identify with someone or something that is bigger than just themselves. And, and I can understand that. I understand gratitude for a heritage or for family. I understand various ideologies and, and hobbies. I, I get all of that. But I'm glad to tell you today that when God sees humanity, he doesn't see us as a bunch of groups. He sees us as individuals. He loves the masses and he loves the single one, the, the one person the Bible tells us in the writings of Paul, for there's no respect of persons with God. God is not for one group or another. God's not picking sides. God's not dividing people up. But there is a sense in which when God views humanity, he sees only two groups. He sees those who are Christians and those who are not Christians. As one old pastor who's in heaven uh, used to say, J. Vernon McGee, God sees the saints and the ain'ts. He sees those who have a relationship with him, and he sees those who don't have a relationship with him. And it's God's desire that those who have a relationship with him would tell those who don't have a relationship with him how they can establish a relationship with him. I know in this room today, right now, as I'm standing here speaking, there are people in this room, you are a Christian. You know it, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and there are some undoubtedly you're not yet a Christian, and I could not be happier that either group is here. I think church is a great place for Christians to come to learn the Word of God. I think church can also be a great place where those who have yet to know Jesus could come to learn more about it and discover what it's all about. But for those who are in the room today who are Christians, you have a story to tell. 
Although our personal stories, uh, they, they may differ in the details. They may vary in a sense. If you're here today and you're a Christian, there are some senses in which your stories are identical. Now the time, the place, the occasion, all of that will be unique to you. But if you're a Christian, we all got there the same way. There was a point in time where we came to understand that we are all sinners. That's what the Bible says. We all fall short. And we understand that God loved us so much that he sent his one and only son to die on the cross. And when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the sin debt of mankind. And we know that through faith in that which Jesus has done, we can be forgiven of our sins and assured of a relationship with God. His presence in our lives for this lifetime, a home in heaven when we die. We know that this was all uh, uh, verified by the victorious, literal, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That that is the gospel. That is the one and only way to come into a relationship with God. And there's another element that every Christian's personal story has in common. Although it was of God, all of God, and of His grace, if you're a Christian today and you think in the story of your life how you came to know Jesus, God used a person or people to come into your life to help you see what it is you did not know you weren't seeing. God used a person in your life to bring you to a place where you could meet Jesus. The Bible in Romans 10 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You see, someone shared the truth of the gospel with you. They shared God's word with you. And Philip was the kind of person who wanted to share Jesus with others. Through divine direction, God led Philip to this man who had been in Jerusalem. This Ethiopian man was a treasurer for, for his entire nation, serving his, king, his queen, Candace. And, and he was in Jerusalem, presumably heard about Jesus there. He, he just couldn't put all the pieces together. And, and he, he was kind of lost, spiritually speaking. When Philip met this man. He was reading the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah specifically. And, and Philip asked this man if he understood what he was reading. And the man very honestly said this. He said, how can I accept some man should guide me? From there, Philip shared Jesus with this man and he was wonderfully saved. But as this encounter unfolds, we find some really helpful, practical, easy to follow steps that Philip used that we can use to be an influence for Jesus Christ in the lives of our friends and neighbors and co-workers and loved ones and, and family and, and on it could go. Philip gives us a great example. And what I love about the steps he took is that there are steps any of us can take if we will. In other words, Philip didn't possess something that we don't have today. It wasn't rocket science. It wasn't brain surgery. It was simply a compassion to share with another what it is you've learned yourself. It's, it's understanding we're just beggars telling other beggars where the bread is, and the bread is Jesus Christ. It's being just that compassionate. Hey, I found something that's changed everything for me. I would like for you to hear of what it is I've learned. So what does the life of Philip teach us about sharing Jesus with others? Well, here's the first step. It may seem simple, but this is where it all begins. Number one, it all starts with obedience, with obedience. If you're still with me, say amen again. Amen. All right, this is a cooperative effort here, all right? It starts with obedience. I love the way it begins in verse 26 when the Bible says the angel of the Lord uh, comes here and the angel says, arise and go. And in verse 27, the Bible says, and he arose and went. God made his will known. Philip, I want you to get up and go. And the Bible says, Philip, get up and got gone. He, he made his way going. In verses 29 and 30, we see the same spirit again. The Bible says, the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him. Friends, for Philip, it was just this simple. If it's something God told him to do, he was going to do it. He didn't walk. He ran. He had a heart that was compliant to the will of God. And when God said, get up and go, he got up and get after it. The first word given to Philip here was go. That's also the first word in that passage we call the Great Commission, where Jesus tells those of us who know him and comprise his church what it is he wants us to be doing. And in Mark 16, Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, I don't want to be needlessly provocative today, but I want to be brutally honest and very clear today. For those of us that know Jesus, the only alternative to sharing Jesus with those in our lives is to miss God's purpose for our life. 
I'm not trying to be needlessly provocative, but I'm, I'm saying today the only alternative to sharing Jesus with others is sin. And I think, wait a minute, Pastor, that's a little over the top, don't you think? No, I don't think so. You think, well, I, I thought a sin was when we did something that, that is wrong. And, and yes, that, that is a sin. We sometimes call those sins of commission. We commit a sin. We do that which is wrong. But there are other kinds mentioned in the Bible that we often call just sins of omission. Sins of commission, sins of omission. I like the story of the Sunday school teacher. She was trying to help the children understand what sin was all about. And at the end, the questions are asked, as teachers do. And the question was asked, can anyone tell me what a sin of commission is? And a very intelligent girl in the front raised her hand. And she said, that's when we choose to do the wrong thing. Teacher said, that's right, fantastic. Who can tell me what a sin of omission is? A less intelligent boy in the back of the class raised his hand, and he said, that's when we really want to do a sin. We just haven't gotten around to doing that one yet, okay? And uh, that's not exactly what a sin of omission is. Here's what the Bible says a sin of omission is. It's when we know we're supposed to do something, and we don't do it. James helps us to understand this in James 4. The Bible says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And I'm saying today it is good and it is right to keep Christ's command to share the good news with others. When God said, Go, Philip ran, he was obedient. Now some of you all got frosty when I got that direct with you. I hope you can see what I'm sharing today is coming from the Word of God. It's from the Bible. But I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on anybody. Because what I know about God is he's a good God and he doesn't want anything from us. He wants it for us. And I know a life that obeys God is not a lesser life. It's not a diminished life. It's not a bad life. It's a good life. And I know that as we share Jesus with others, it's going to bring a joy to our lives that nothing can replicate. It's one of the great joys of knowing that we're obeying the Lord in our lives in that way. If we're still friends, say amen. amen. I don't believe you. It all starts with obedience. Number two, Philip teaches me this. It's always good to ask questions. It's always good to ask questions, all right? Now, I got to tell you who likes to know it all. Nobody. Nobody likes to know it all, all right? It's good for us to remember that. Now, I have found most people who act as though they're know-it-alls, they don't actually know it all. How many of you have discovered that as well? But maybe you're here today and you do know it all. I've got to share something with you. Do yourself a favor and don't act like you actually know it all, okay? I think a lot of Christians undercut their witness by rushing into a conversation and thinking what this person needs is just a good stern talking to. That often does not work. That often does not go well. We need to make sure our heart is right in all of this. Jesus said in Matthew 10, he said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. How's that for a pep talk? (laughs) All right, guys, here's what we're doing. It's like you're sheep. I'm sending you out to the wolves. But then Jesus said this. He said, Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Jesus said, As you're doing my work in this this rough and tumble world in which we're living, I want you to make sure that you're wise and that you're harmless. That's how he wants us to live. Philip did not start with assertions. He started with assessments. After noticing the man reading the book of Isaiah specifically, we we find the words he was reading here in the New Testament. We can go back to the Old Testament and figure out this man was reading in Isaiah chapter 53, which amazingly, miraculously, was an Old Testament passage prophesying of the work of Jesus Christ. He, He finds this man reading chapter 53. And so where does Philip begin? Not by saying, I know that chapter, I've read that chapter. No, he he comes to him and he says, and I quote, Understandest thou what thou readest? Hey, I see what you're reading there. Do you you understand what you're reading there? A question. A question. It was a simple question. You see, statements harden the will. Questions probe the conscience. Philip did not want a monologue, he wanted a dialogue, so he comes and he begins with a question. Now Jesus, the greatest soul winner ever, loved to ask questions. In fact, sometimes people would ask Jesus a question, he'd say, that's a good question, but let me ask you this question. He would answer a question with a question, but, but Jesus had this to say. He said, while the, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, 
saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. And really what I want to take out of that verse is, is Jesus asked a question. And he used the answer to their question in that passage to lead them into greater truths. I love talking to people who visit our church. And I have to tell you that when our church was getting started, I was so eager to get the good news of Jesus out that I'd schedule time to get together with them. And then I would just open my mouth and start talking and talking and talking. And I was loving it because I'm sharing the good news of Jesus. Who doesn't want to share the good news in a world with so much bad news? We get to share good news. And I would just talk and talk and talk. And I would be loving it. And I discovered that although I was enjoying this one-way conversation, they were often thinking, when is this guy going to shut up, you know? How many of you thought that about me before? Just my wife. Okay, that's good. That's good. I got it down to one, all right? And I learned, you know what? It's best to have a conversation. I love to talk to people who've come to Coastline. How did you hear of our church? Man, I get some of the most interesting stories. Did you enjoy the service? Was there anything we did or said that you thought was odd? Maybe you have a question about that. And, and I love to just ask questions and get people talking. And what happens when you ask questions is you earn the credibility to speak when it's your time to speak it all starts with obedience it's always good to ask questions number three pay attention to what people say pay attention to what people say let's listen again to verses 30 and 31 the bible says philip ran thither to him and heard him he heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said understandest thou what thou readest and he said how can i except some man should guide me and he desired philip that he would come listen to this i love this come up and sit with him. Philip asked the question, and, and this man from Ethiopia thought, that's the kind of guy I want to come up and sit with me. Philip was interested. He was listening. And people who listen are the type of person you'd like to, hey, why don't you come up and sit down? <laughs> Let's have a talk. I love that. Listen to this verse, Mark 5. The Bible says, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. Jesus so often refused to speak until he had first listened. That set the stage for the rest of the conversation. Over and over, that's how he worked. One compliment I don't hear near as often as I'd like, but when I do, it always means a lot when someone will say to me, you know what, you're a good listener. You're a good listener. I'm not, I'm not saying I get that right all the time. I'm just saying when I do, it's amazing the impact a life can have when someone's willing to ask questions and then listen to where someone is and what it is they're going through. That leads us to the next thought. Philip teaches us fourth here to share the gospel of Jesus. Of Jesus. So when Philip earned the opportunity to speak... How did he earn that? I mean, he followed Jesus where he was supposed to go. He sees this guy, asks questions. He listens to the reply. And, and so now it's his turn to speak. And boy, does he have something to say. He was a good listener, and he was a good speaker. And in verse 35, the Bible says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And I love that. What was his message? Jesus. What was his title? Jesus. What was his text? Jesus. That was the message that he preached. He didn't, he didn't preach about his church. And that church in Jerusalem, man, it was quite a church. He didn't preach about Peter. Peter was a great preacher, but that's not what it was that Philip was interested in preaching about. He didn't preach about politics or his opinion on this or that. That. He saw the need as the great need, which is the message of Jesus Christ. He preached Jesus. I like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2. He said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus and him crucified. He said, what, what's the message of, of your church? Jesus. Jesus. For people that don't know the Lord, the message is Jesus. By the way, for those of us who've known the Lord for years, the message is still Jesus. We just never really get beyond the power found in the gospel message of Jesus. A lot of Christians want to talk about the Bible, and we know the Bible metaphorically says it's like a sword. And we talk about our sword. Coastline, I'm trying to tell you today, we need to talk less about our sword, and we need to use it more. Let people know about the hope you personally have in Christ. If you're, if, if you're a Christian today, say amen. amen. Let people know of the hope that you have in Christ. 
In Colossians, the Bible says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. The gospel is the message that lets people know of the hope that we have in Christ. It is personal. It's not about a church. It's not about a denomination. It's not about a pastor. It's not about political views or ideology. It's not about anything else. Share what you know about Jesus. This is good preaching today. I think Jesus would like it. He wants to remind the church, hey, get back on point. It's about the Lord, His message. This is the final thought I'll share with you today. Number, number five, we must continue to care. In the end of this accounting, we read this. The Bible says, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized. Evidently, while in Jerusalem, he'd seen some of these Christ followers following Jesus in baptism, and again, not knowing what it meant, but now as he comes to know Jesus, he, he knows, well, that's what Christians do. That's what Christians do. Once they get saved, they follow the Lord and believers' baptism. Beautiful picture in that. We step in the water, it crosses us. Picture of the cross upon which Jesus died. We go beneath the water. It's a picture of the burial of Jesus. We come out of the water. It's a, it's a picture of the, of the resurrection of Jesus and how we have new life in Jesus. And so this man, he's already putting this together. And he thinks, well, man, I, I'm believing what he's saying about Jesus. Here's some water. Philip, can I just go ahead and, and get baptized right here? And Philip said, well, if you believe, because we don't get saved by getting baptized. We get saved by faith. And then we follow the Lord in baptism. He said, if you believe with all your heart, thou mayest. And he answered, and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Philip cared enough for this man to help him progress in his new life in Christ, beginning with believers' baptism. Just a heart of compassion for people. I've read that as many of, as 95% of Christians have never shared the gospel of Jesus with anybody. And I'd say if that's true, 95% of Christians are missing out on one of the greatest joys you'll ever experience in life. And sharing Jesus with someone and seeing those spiritual lights come on when they put together. You mean I don't have to pay for my sin? Jesus did. And he loves me and wants a relationship with me. When God uses your life to touch someone else's life, it'll bring a freshness and a vitality to your walk with him. One reason as Christians we miss out on joy in the course of our life is sometimes it ceases to be as fresh as it should be. And I want you to know as it comes to being a follower of Jesus, we either evangelize or we fossilize. We didn't, we, we weren't saved for nothing. Free to us cost Jesus so much and he says in response, to my death for you, would you live for me? It's kind of like the difference of going to Disneyland with adults versus going with children. If you go to Disneyland with adults, the complaining starts at the ticket price, right? It's like, what? Yeah, no, I don't want to buy this place. I just want to spend some time here, you know? The complaining starts there, and, and uh, then you start telling stories. You know, when I was a kid, you didn't even have to pay to get in Disneyland. How many of you know that's true? You just got to walk in. You don't. You, you used to walk into Disneyland. You didn't pay to get in. Then you'd buy a little ticket book, e-ticket rides, you know. And how many of you know what I'm talking about? Keep your hands up. Look around. These are the old people like me. Okay. That's how it used to be. So old people, you walk to Disneyland, and, and it's like a ticket. What, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. When I was younger, we didn't have to buy tickets to get into Disneyland. We could get in, and popcorn costs this much, and, and a hot dog costs that much. And, and we'll walk around and, and talk about the old days, and we'll gripe about lines, and we'll gripe about crowds. And, and i, I got to tell you, I was at Disneyland not too long ago, and I saw a parade coming my way. My, my visceral response, I didn't have to think about it. It was on the tip of my brain when I saw a parade coming. I thought, i got to get out of here. That parade's going to be noise and people, and i got to get away from here. But when you go to Disneyland with children, it's a different thing altogether. Oh, man, you, you see it through their eyes. The lamest ride in the entire world, which is it's a small world, <laughs> becomes so entertaining when you're sitting next to a child who's looking around at this. 
it's a small world after all. And you're like, they're loving it, and I love them, and so I'm loving it, and I've got joy in an old crusty place. That ride's been around forever, and I'm now enjoying it again because I'm seeing it through the eyes of a child. Man, I've been to Disneyland with my grandkids. I never complain about the price of popcorn or this or that. I'm just so happy they're there. There's a freshness. There's a vitality. Something that's old to me as a a California kid, it becomes new and fresh. And if you want to add joy, invigorate your Christian life, I'm talking about vitality. Do what Jesus saves you to do. Share him with somebody else. One of the best ways to enjoy a relationship with Jesus is to help someone else come into a relationship with Jesus. That's what Open House is all about. It's my best attempt as a pastor to facilitate an environment and an atmosphere and get some fun stuff here to help you do, if you're a Christian, what I believe you already want to do. Help the people in your life come to a place where they can hear about Jesus. In his book, The Unchurched Next Door, author and researcher Tom Rainer wrote these words. 82% of the unchurched are at least somewhat likely to attend church if invited. That that was like, put the book down and just think on that for a minute. This guy studied these things and says, yeah, 82% of the people in our lives are at least somewhat likely to come to church if we would extend an invitation to them. Do you understand the capacity we have to see lives changed and families changed and family trees changed and communities changed? I'm saying today the power is not of us. The power is in the gospel message. And as we extend an invitation, we are surrounded by people every day of our life who are likely to respond. But the statement he followed that one with to me is equally incredible but for just different reasons. So we got about 82% of the people in our lives. If we just said, uh, open house, habit burger, inflatable games, pumpkin patch, 82% of the people in our lives would say, sure, what time? But what he said next is amazing. He said only 2% of church members invite an unchurched person to church. 98% of churchgoers never extend an invitation. Those statements leave me wondering what would happen if we decided to be Christians like Philip, who just take the leap and say, would you, with me next Sunday? It makes me wonder. Now, I got to tell you, I can get crabby with the best of them about how things are going in our community and in our state and in our world. What they need is Jesus. And Jesus would look at us today and say, yeah, that's why I said so, send I you. They need you. They need you to speak of him. And next week is nothing more, nothing less than an opportunity, an excuse. It's a sanctified excuse to say, hey, friend. Family, coworker, loved one, unloved one, friend, person I don't like, come to a place where you can hear about Jesus. Imagine if we decided to obey the great commission that Jesus left for his church. We obeyed his command if we had conversations where we truly listened to people we directed them to Jesus, I'd imagine we'd find progress in God's work as well as a joy in our Christian lives of knowing we're doing what it is He wants us to do. Our Father, we thank You for the clarity of Your purpose lived out through the life of Philip. God, I pray You touch our hearts. That's where it's got to begin. May we learn today. Help us. Thank you for watching today's service. It's our prayer, whether you're a friend near or far, 
that today's services were a help and encouragement to you. If you'd like to get more connected with us, stop by our website, or maybe you have a prayer request or a question that we can help you with, feel free to drop us an email. Again, these services are designed to help you encourage and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. If we can ever do anything for you, please let us know. And it's our prayer that we'll get to worship with you again soon.